Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Cantina Club. Uh, this week, we've got a regular episode where we're going to talk about the Bad Batch, just a general discussion, and we're going to get into it right after this. We all know around here, oh, okay. Solo always does shots first. Sing it, your love, raise your glass, and sing your love, sing it with me, your love. Bitches, ashes, ashes, ashes. <laughs> it's the bad bitch. <laughs> bad, bad bitch. It's like New York. Though. It kind of does, yeah. Kind of like a northeastern accent. <laughs> All right, we're uh, we're back, and uh, we just wanted to take. Uh, a bit of an episode this week just kind of take some time to talk about the bad batch since we haven't really been able to uh to discuss it we haven't really had the schedules haven't worked out to do a an episode by episode discussion like we do with some shows in the past uh but we definitely didn't want to, to let it go without um without discussing it so um currently uh we've had 10 episodes at this point uh at the the time of this recording anyway there may be another one up by the time i post this but uh but at the time of this recording um the most recent episode was common ground which was episode 10 and before we go any further there will be spoilers <laughs> insert course, yeah. spoiler alert <laughs> insert spoiler alert so if you have not watched the season and you want to course, be surprised yeah. the whole planet away. is one big city <laughs> Rick Oli, spoiler master. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Chancellor Palpatine. It's season seven of Clone Wars. <laughs> the most powerful politician is one big uh, Sith. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, well, let's just start out overall. Just kind of give me your uh, your overall impressions of the of the series thus far. Just kind of what do you take from it, and uh, what, what how you think it kind of stacks up against Clone Wars, which clearly it's a direct spinoff of Clone Wars, so it's obviously going to be compared. Yeah, well, um, it's very sequely. <laughs> it's not <laughs> Clone Wars. It's very different, even though it started at first with kind of the announcer voice and all that, but they ditched that after the first episode. Yeah. Only the first episode. Yeah. Um, So it's like a long movie or something. Mm -hmm. Um, The pacing is pretty good. Uh, The animation is one of the main things I was looking forward to seeing whether it would be more like clone wars or more like rebels or something. And it's definitely great and has its own style and color palette that uh, looks interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Um. We're definitely getting look, looking more distressed and more more like Empire days than Republic days. <laughs> and most of the, right. and if you think about it, it's set after a period of a long war, so a lot mm-hmm. of stuff shows that you know stress of being involved in in a in a long war. Right. Um, but uh, overall impressions, I really enjoy it. I look forward to it each week. But it's for me, this is personally, uh, it's not must watch like. I can wait to watch it. Mand- uh, the Mandalor or the Mandalorian, <laughs> the, Mandalor- <laughs> the Mandalorian. I-, I pretty much was so afraid of spoilers and was excited to see it that you know I would wrangle you guys to watch it. We would wrangle as quickly as possible. This is more of a, uh, you know, not everything has to be flagship. Uh, so I'm perfectly fine with it, but it's not as compelling as the Mandalorian or mm-hmm. possibly Clone Wars. I was more excited about uh, season seven of Clone Wars. Um, but you got to give time for the characters to grow on you and everything and the plot to get going. My other overall impression, uh, it, you know, mostly good and I enjoy it. Uh, it is veering towards the Mandalorian territory a little too much, a little too close for comfort for me, where I feel like I'm starting to watch the same show again, um, mm-hmm. which makes me question whether there's going to be a formula going forward with a lot and of you're, shows. And you're basically referring to the main MacGuffin at this point? Yes. Yeah. yeah. MacGuffin character. It, she's more than a MacGuffin. Oh, but no, her she, she origin is, but... is a, her origin is a MacGuffin, and her importance mm-hmm. to the story is a MacGuffin, much as right. Grogu was. You know, yeah. uh, Grogu, as big a mystery as he was, we had like three lines of explanation about him. <laughs> you know, at all of the Mandalorian, so they're not big on you know delivering details with their main mysteries and stuff. But so that's my right. overall impression. Really enjoy it. I really have no huge <laughs> critique of it or anything because my expectations were low. And it sits in a niche where it can comfortably do whatever it wants. I just think in some regards with the main story, they might be playing it a little safe. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, so for my, my impressions, I mean, I really, really enjoy the show. Obviously we all, if anybody's watched the show before knows I, my passion for the clone wars. Uh, and for me, this is just more of the same uh, because like you said, it's not the clone wars, but right. it's just an extension of the clone wars. You know, it's, it's the like next a side story or plot. that just It's like a side story or plot that they're focusing on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That they're focusing on and, uh, and animation wise, it's clearly, like you said, it kind of has its own unique color palette it it's it's definitely the next step in the evolution of the animation which we already saw last year with season you know season seven the final season of clone wars they'd even up their game a little bit by then they've done it yet again um and it's it's just it's interesting that um that they've chosen to start i, I like the fact that they start they start the the first episode basically right around where exactly where clone wars ends so you're still in basically it actually starts just prior to order 66 um so you get that straight transition into the post clone wars era and this is an era i've always been really interested in i know there's probably books and comics and all kinds of stuff uh, that have covered this this time period i've just never really read them so i guess and you want to see it visually right i want to see it visually i have kind (laughs) of i think that's why i've been holding out you know just kind of waiting for either a film or a series like this to kind of take us through that time period to really show us what it's like because i've always been intrigued by what that transition looked like in the galaxy you know when when they trans you know when when the empire takes over and how they gain so much control so quickly and all that um but yeah overall i love uh the i love the characters we've already talked of course in the past about the bad batch characters uh i really like uh the the crew um and the fact that echoes joined them you know full time i really love that um so yeah, overall, I have again like you, I have no no complaints, and I think I probably had higher expectations than you did, Greedo, uh, just yeah. because it's my show, you know. Yeah, this is right in your wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah, and uh, <laughs> so I, I I naturally came into it, you know, wanting it to be just amazing, and it it hasn't let me down. And again, it it like I think you summed it up best though. You said it's not a not every show has to be a flagpole show, you no. know. It doesn't have to be a tent pole show, and no, um, it doesn't have to do that. And this is not clearly, you know. I mean, um, it's it's great when things are more than you expected and everything. This is I didn't know what right. to expect from this other right. than exactly. the Bad Batch was going to be in it. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. I think they've done a good job of of differentiating the characters, you know, mm-hmm. of um, pulling off a show with basically you know one actor <laughs> or two yeah, actors. I know it's two actors basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, yeah, but uh, D. Bradley Baker just taking on. You exactly, know, I, it doesn't I love how feel his, like the two credits actors, at the end. Yeah. It just says the Bad Batch. D. Bradley Baker right. doesn't differentiate the different <laughs> voices. <laughs> it's kind of uh, makes me think like, what if Rogue One, if the first, um, you know, hour of Rogue One had been a series building up right. to the end of Rogue mm-hmm. One or something? You know, uh, you can you can draw this stuff out as long as you want. The problem is, it starts to feel a little like filler, like. Um, they really uh, kind of need to lock in at some point to what the main thrust of the story is because yeah. at the beginning I found it very compelling when we're sitting there with the clones and the emperor is addressing them and then the empire is trying to decide what to do with them and they're struggling with where they fit in their identity and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, that stuff's very compelling. And then you kind of have them leave. There's, you know, that stuff is resolved almost in a mini movie kind of situation. Mm-hmm. And then you have them setting up a home base with a new alien. Is it Sid? Is that the alien's Sid. name? Mm-hmm. Being yeah, kind the of like their, mm-hmm. yeah, it's almost, again, it's a little video game-ish, uh, like, you know, you're getting missions from this alien right. character. It, it, much like the Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. It's a big, great video games. It's very, very and, similar, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and probably a lot of these people that write them grew up on video games, so, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure that's where the inspiration's coming yeah, from. Yeah, it's perfectly yeah. okay. To, uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, you kind of have these episodes that sort of run in place a little bit where you're establishing that dynamic of they're in a new place. It took them several episodes to pay off their debt to Sid, you know, mm-hmm. and so you're just kind of running in place, figuring, you know, using that as a motivation for plots uh, week after week or whatever. Yeah. So uh, you, you got to find an identity at some point and, uh, well, you know, I said I wouldn't complain or anything, but it's just critiquing a little bit. Again, we're hitting another Star Wars series um, without a well-defined villain. Mm-hmm. And um, you can say Crosshair is the villain, and I love him as a villain, 
I like the I've always liked the character since he was first introduced. So I have no problem with <laughs> yeah. the character. But everyone else wants Tarkin leaves in that first mini movie. And we we have Tarkin's identity very well established. We know him. I don't even remember the name of the Imperial who replaced him. I know he's like an ambitious younger officer who wants to figure out how to use the clones and mm-hmm. the recruits and everything together to create these squads, which I suspect, you know, could be the origin of the death troopers. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, but I know nothing about that dude. And um, maybe they just don't find those Imperial characters. Maybe they just find them interchangeable and not really compelling characters or villains. So we're not right. But, you know, you had Callus and rebels. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you you've got to have at some point an identifiable uh, antagonist, which yeah, right now give, is Crosshair. You know, you got to well, right? I mean, you got to give some of them some level of humanity, mm-hmm. like they did Callus in Rebels. You yeah, know, or you, they showed or his you, story arc about how he turns basically yeah. from. Or you from, have to identify mm-hmm. why we should be afraid of them and what right. they're doing, oh, right, and why exactly. they're doing it, and uh there has to be something to really push against Mm -hmm. the bad batch has always been like almost like superhero clones yeah like a lot of times you don't really feel really feel like they were in danger from their inception on because they're just so badass or whatever Mm -hmm. they're very confident they can handle anything and they're survivors you know just like rex um so that's all is i would hope just like the mandalorian i was praying for a good villain uh, for two seasons and we just you know barely got enough to kind of hang on and mm-hmm. some interchangeable villains in there that were really well done yeah um, right so yeah that would be my critique is i i wonder what the uh the, this mission plot from week to week can't go on obviously, right forever yeah so, I, I agree if i had to come up with a critique it would be that it would be the fact that it's I hesitate to say cookie cutter, um, but it is. It does seem a bit modeled on the same direction as the as the Mandalorian, mm-hmm. uh, with it's just you know what what's the new mission this week as opposed to, you know what's the, what you know is there an overall story arc which there is, uh, you know because they do have a few connecting you know plot points and stuff, but overall it does seem like it's just kind of a a, a few standalone episodes here and there where they come to the the place where Sid, you know, the bar where Sid runs it, they find out what the next mission is, they go do it, and they come back, you know, yeah. and, and that's it, you know, and then we, you know, that's it, roll credits, mm-hmm. and then we do it again next week. It seems like the last three or four episodes has kind of turned into that. So I don't know if that means that they're going to continue to do that, or maybe, well, hopefully, I'm hoping anyway, that one of these missions ends up le- leaning into something big that starts another, like, major story arc, maybe. Yeah. Maybe they'll go that route. Uh, now, I have heard rumors, um, and again, this is all unfounded stuff you just hear on YouTube, and, you know, you, know, you take that with a lot of salt, but um, uh, but basically, the, the, the word on the street, as it were, is that there's supposed to be a... Um, uh, what's the word uh, basically a huge ending to this season that basically something is going to have it up. something that's going to like impact all of it is what they're saying mm-hmm. that there's going to be some sort of reveal i don't know what it is but you know it's some sort of reveal or some sort of action is going to happen that is going to oh I, I, that's the, the phrase that they use saga wide implications is what they're saying that's going to have saga wide implications at the end of this season i mean we'll see if that comes true or not but so if that is the case, then uh, I'm assuming the they MacGuffin are building thing. up to something. What's that? That could be the whole MacGuffin thing. You know? True, true. Because it's been revealed that, well, spoilers again, people. Uh, yeah. It's been revealed that Omega is uh, Omega. <laughs> is, Omega. Uh, Omega <laughs> is uh, Boba Fett's sister. Almost sibling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fellow original clone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Which, the, she's the only one left that is uh, from original source material. Right. Uh, which, I don't know. I don't know how that, why they didn't keep that original material. It's yeah. kind of weird to me, but maybe they just yeah. used it all up. And, Probably. Uh, but uh, anyway, but you know, they're first generation clones, which means from them could be clones second generation. So again, mm-hmm. I don't really understand the why they're so special. But, right. they, you know, obviously the cloners have big plans for them. And we already had a reveal of some creatures and tanks and stuff. So the, and we, and we had in the Mandalorian, the same kind of thing, you know, tanks, experiments, a clone engineer, mm-hmm. um, maybe they're going to tie this stuff together into the saga plot of how the cloners fit in to the ongoing saga as it continued after return of the Jedi. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mandalorian into the sequel trilogy. Mm-hmm. That would, maybe be my guess but their other thing would be saga wide implications could mean the return of ezra it could mean 
a big character cameo like Luke well it can be the return Red of ezra Lloyd. because of the timeline this is happening well, before ezra even is it, but this all happens before rebels oh you're right yeah okay yeah. all right so i'm way off base there but yeah. uh yeah it, it could have they've already brought in uh kanan you know mm-hmm. as a, he's a young man you're right he's, right he's, oh, god i'm so glad he didn't stick around yeah um, <laughs> that <laughs> was impossible right for him to be more annoying than he was <laughs> he was about to take jar jar Sapat as most annoying <laughs> Star Wars character ever the young Kanan, not the old one. The old one was yeah, great. no, the old one was great. But yeah, <laughs> the young one was a little. Although I got, I have to admit, I have to. Admit, I found it annoying too. But when I watched it a second time, I did watch the first episode a second time. I didn't find him near as annoying the second time. Yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> but good for you. Uh, to, uh, yeah, good for you. No, but to to touch on what you said with Omega, um, I think honestly, I guess one of the only other differences with the source material is that it they're they're their growth rate was unaltered yeah you know, that, that they grow at a normal human rate versus the accelerated rate of the clones right. so that i know that's one difference that i'm thinking of but yeah beyond that i'm not really sure what source material matters you know when it comes to the clones i really don't know how the science of that were or how the the science within star wars works on that mm-hmm. so yeah yeah i hope it's something that begins to reveal some answers to some things you know they've they've done a good job of entertaining us and being very vague about a whole bunch of things and providing easter eggs and hints um to get everybody intrigued and that works really well for a time to get people talking and watching um you know between the force awakens and the last jedi people the mm-hmm. internet was on fire with all the speculation and everything mm-hmm. and, um but it's also a great way to overreach with the expectations and everything at some point you got to to stick to something commit to something right. and, and reveal something you know yeah exactly and um but it could just you, you throw me off with the saga light implications because what i would like to see is implications that are good for the show you know for the <laughs> bad batch uh the multiverse thing of just building interlayered interlayered stuff is is great but it's also can be dangerous because mm-hmm you you start to rely on that to dig you out of a hole or to Mm -hmm. propel your material when your material isn't all that strong you know um you link it to something that people are excited about and becomes you know more interesting or whatever right exactly but but i I guess this is you know it's ambitious and um that's what marvel's been doing forever Mm -hmm. so that's um, true that's true and they're all under the uh, same umbrella now so they're all kind of feeding off each other i think but um so overall uh just kind of taking a step back from plot points overall i really like the characters you know i think the bad yeah. batch themselves you know i think they've done a really good job differentiating you know it's not just i mean the point of the bad batch is that they're different from the standard clones um they're you know uh, yeah the, so the main ones are basically the leaders hunter uh we've got wrecker crosshair tech and then of course echo who was a regular uh clone in the clone wars um who if you watch you know the final season you'll see how he kind of joins them um but i really like uh how they've differentiated each character and given them their own each each one their own personality and uh and i like all their personalities like you said we've already touched a little bit on crosshair um but they basically made him one of the primary antagonists at this point because they've altered his 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 chip in his head to make him you know hyper aggressive you know uh, and antagonistic towards his uh his fellow clones um so he went from being a team member basically to to hunting them down uh, mm-hmm. and then you've got hunter again who's the leader he tends to be the clear head but at the same time he's not one of those super leaders he's he, they show him constantly doubting himself and not knowing necessarily what to do and and the fact that you throw omega into the situation he's trying to figure out how to deal with that because he's, he's never like the dad dealt with a child he's the, he's the dad right he's the guy. dad of the group exactly <laughs> yeah right and uh and then you've got wrecker who's like the uh the teenager adolescent of the right. group you know who's the big bulky strong man and uh but yet you know heart of gold but also just silly and always laughing and he basically just seems like all he has one function is just he just wants to fight and and break things you know which is yeah. his name wrecker you know because that's what he does he just likes to wreck things um and then of course you've got tech who i really love tech he's quickly becoming my favorite just because of the dry delivery and he's very yeah. practical everything is and he's also the 
by far the most intelligent of them um and so he'll hard, always hard to believe it's the same guy doing the voice too that's the thing <laughs> that's what's so amazing about different. bradley baker you know is that he he's able to just use his voice to immediately you know who's talking you know you don't have to see the character to know which one is talking so yeah it's it's, it's fantastic the job he does but yeah i just i just love how they've uh, how they do tech with um with <laughs> with with these you know he's he's intelligent almost to the point of arrogance but not quite you yeah. know it's almost like oh i have to deal with these peons sometimes you know when they don't get something right away you know and he just kind of ha- always has to have those side comments of like oh i thought that was obvious you know he's <laughs> like uh he's like spock meets k2so almost, right but he's not no that's sarcastic. right yeah that's, that's- that's He's not as sarcastic on purpose as K2SO is. But. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, Spock's intelligence with uh, with K2SO's. Uh, He's like a like three PO or K2SO. He's very much into exposition. He is the exposition yeah guy. yeah. He talks most a lot. of the time. He is the exposition <laughs> guy. They're all, right. you know, Spock was the exposition guy on on Star Trek. And yeah, most exactly. of the time. And, right, and unless it was a medical episode, it was McCoy. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, right, exactly. And yeah, then I, got, I, you know, I love the characters. Yeah. Yeah. And so, okay. So let's talk about those. You know, we've also got, you know, Omega and I know you've kind of yeah. been hit or miss with her. Um, I like Omega just fine. Yeah. I think mean, she's, yeah. she's a good character. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just, you know, I, I, I think they've done, I, I, I had a little bit of a worry uh, like you did at the beginning um, that they were just, you know, going to throw a kid in there and, you know, just for the sake of having a cute effect. But I think that as long as they've used the, the character wisely and which they've done you know like like you said they've, they're kind of taking her along the route of um i think you were kind of referring to her almost as like uh what did you call her the uh kind of like what they're doing with baby yoda you know you were afraid that they were going to do that oh the like the magical child <laughs> right right yeah when she- yeah the kind of uh this is the objective and the magical child that there's always you know it's from the um I forget the name of it, but the Natalie Portman's first movie, The Professional, all the way to, you know, it's just many, mm-hmm. many, it's a, it's a trope where you have mm-hmm. the, the mercenary or killer or soldier or whatever, some tough guy paired with a kid and then it flips their whole perspective. And that's the whole premise right. of The Mandalorian from the first episode on. And, right. Um, um, yeah, Bad, bad Batch is, th- that's the only thing, um, Hunter's kind of taken on that dad role so fast, you know, um, and uh, yeah, you know, so I don't know. It, it, Mandalorian, they built to that quite a bit mm. more. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, and they, you know, the Mandalorian was a much more hardcore character, I guess. It makes sense. But, right. But, um, but yeah, Omega is, uh, you know, the maybe the character with the most potential out of all of the characters on the show mm-hmm. because. Um, the other characters are like the A team, you know, or any other team. There's a communications guy, there's mm-hmm. an engineer, there's a. Uh, the only thing they don't have is like a doctor, you know. But, right. But they have the they have the leader who's good at he's a jack of all trades. Mm-hmm. They have the brawler guy who's not you know real great at making plans, but yeah, takes the damage he may not be the brightest, but he's yeah. the strongest. Uh, I mean, yeah. they, everybody. There's no two of a person, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's no they're mm-hmm. not two brawlers. They don't. Have, yeah, everybody they, has their own everybody, unique identity. Everybody fits a niche, and that and that that works for this you know form well f word alert formula, but mm-hmm. but. uh but anyway, she's the one that doesn't fit the mold except for the tra- traditional role of the kid in this scenario who's there to influence them to change. But right. the, the kid has to change also, you know, and has to have some purpose and has to do some things. Uh, so what will be interesting is if they decide to take any risks there or uh, because already Omega has been exposed to a lot of different things. There's, she's seen a lot of potential role models, a lot of potential dangers, traumatic mm-hmm. things, things to learn from, you know. Um, so how is she going to, what direction is she going to go is the question. Right. We already know what the Bad Batch is going to do. They did have the chip, which brought in the uncertainty, but they removed those. Uh, pretty right. quickly, I thought. I thought it might have been a little more interesting if they left them in for a while. Oh, yeah, yeah, they actually, because they were starting to have some issues arise from them, so they yeah. went and took them out within, I think, around six or seven episodes. Yeah, which was a yeah. great episode, but mm-hmm. but uh, but yeah, so she's the one with the biggest question mark and most potential. The others is like, 
you know, yeah, there's a lot of potential there, but it's it's more of the action adventure territory. Mm-hmm. We already know their characters came into this well defined. Right. Uh, they're, yeah, they're re-navigating their way in a universe that has changed. Uh, um, but it's but it's not like their entire characters have been flipped on their heads. They're still who they are, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, right. <clears throat> so anyway. So um, so let's move on to cameos. Um, we've had quite a few. Uh, already just in the first 10 episodes uh we'll go back to oh, the yeah, beginning and, interesting i don't know that i can remember them all i hope you can well we started out yeah <laughs> well we started out with a couple of episodes we had uh tarkin which of course at this point he's admiral tarkin he's not even a grand moff yet um but uh, we had uh tarkin uh kind of like what you were talking about he was dealing with trying to incorporate or trying to basically get a reading on the bad batch see if they were going to be loyal enough to be members of the empire uh which you know obviously that didn't work out so well <laughs> um, but but i liked seeing tark and of course obviously he's in clone wars as well so it wasn't like a complete shock because he's already been in uh, in a couple of uh, story arcs in clone wars um then we've got um fennec shan of course from mandalorian fame obviously we've got uh, We've got her in a couple of episodes as obviously as her character is a bounty hunter uh, and she's trying to uh, to track down Omega and take her away from the Bad Batch. Uh, so that was kind of cool seeing uh, seeing that character and just getting a little bit more of her background. Uh, and it's interesting, too, because I think um, Greedo and I were talking this weekend when we were watching some stuff together. And it was, uh, you know, we we're kind of doing the math on the age. You know, and I know that the <laughs> actress who plays Phoenix Shan is roughly in her early 50s. And but yet we've got um, it, it's basically 30 years before. So that's perfect. So she'd be about 20. Let's say she's 20 years old in Bad Batch. 30 years later, she would be 50. So it actually does work because I was yeah. thinking like, wait, she's already an adult and then 30 years. Like, but wait, yeah, that's right. The the, the math works mm-hmm. out. She just looks really that's good for her age. Her, that's the thing. That's why I didn't realize she was because yeah. I think I guess that she was like in her 30s or 40s <laughs> yeah. but um yeah you have to remember this is way earlier on the timeline and she's yeah new to the job and everything right so. yeah she's still new at this point yeah she's an old veteran by by the mandalorian she's probably uh, like 18 or 20 or something mm-hmm. yeah exactly very young um so then of course we've got um and was in there uh, Sid, who is the new, uh, this is the Transdotion, a Trandoshan character, which is the same as Bosk. Uh, if you're familiar with, uh, obviously, Bosk from not only Clone Wars, but Empire Strikes Back. And she's the one who runs a bar uh, on um, Ord Mantell and is giving them the Bad Batch their missions. I really like this character. I think, uh, I think she works. Um, she has just that right sort of personality that she's written with, and she's voiced by Rhea Perlman, who's perfect for this. Yeah. <laughs> um, as those of you who don't know Rhea Perlman, she was uh, she's uh, Danny DeVito's wife, and she's appeared in uh, several things over the years like that. Cheers. But, uh, cheers. Well, Cheers was uh, probably the biggest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but she's great. Yeah, she was fantastic. Uh, really enjoy that character. Um, and it's important to like that character, or at least to find that character believable, because by the fifth episode or so she plays a major role for the looks like the rest of the yeah. season and she's um, the other main character now so pretty much yeah exactly yeah. uh and then of course the best one the best cad one? bane <laughs> all right <laughs> cad bane <laughs> the seventh <laughs> best character in star wars history pretty close yeah, was, yeah. I, th- I think when we did our top 10 he was around like number eight I think. yeah, was number was, eight. yeah. for he's, you i just love <laughs> for me yeah, for me yeah. hey, that's fine yeah it's, <laughs> he's such a great character I mean, I, I literally like r2 want, or yoda or something. i'm so bad that i want a cad bane series okay i just want a cad bane series just every week just him going out and finding bounties <laughs> i just want that so that's how much i love that character he's so freaking cool <laughs> how many bounty hunter shows can they do <laughs> well, they can definitely do this one <laughs> which, yeah, which, he, which baby creature will he stumble across like yeah, exactly uh, jabba to try and soften him <laughs> you know, yeah he'll have a baby jabba a baby, <laughs> what <hut>. baby, is <laughs> or that? baby ewok oh god a baby ewok no. well maybe it'll be like you a baby rodian <laughs> yeah baby rodian that'd be cool that'd be, that'd be another green baby though exactly that's can, true two green ones well they do have good the rodians do come <laughs> in other colors so. okay all right. <laughs> we'll have a tan one <laughs> yeah. 
looks like yeah. a vinyl seat <laughs> in his spaceship <laughs> exactly um so basically that's uh you know i i like where they're going with it uh you know the the plot formulas aside like we talked about uh but i'm still it's very enjoyable i'm i'm really really enjoying the show and mm-hmm. i look forward to the episode each week like you said it's not it's not a mandalorian it's not a tentpole series um it's not a show that i necessarily unlike mandalorian it's not like well every friday first thing i gotta watch the new episode you know yeah um, i even got about four or five episodes behind at one point i actually last weekend and caught up a couple of weekends ago was over at Greedos and got caught up on about five straight episodes yeah. <laughs> in one sitting you know <laughs> just to get caught up so that's not to say that i don't enjoy it it's it's a fantastic series and i'm really anxious to see where they're uh, where they're going to take it and uh and and i'm just excited the fact that they have 16 episodes you know i was really afraid they were going to have another mini series where it's only like eight or ten episodes but the fact that they're going a full 16 i think is really cool so so uh, what are your uh, final thoughts on clone on, on excuse me on clone wars on uh, bad batch uh it is what it is so just again i've said this about the mandalorian too when i think about it while we're sitting here talking about it a lot of my critiques or observations you could just change the names and it's the same kind of critiques and observations i had about the mandalorian except i found the mandalorian more compelling you know just more visually stunning more Mm -hmm. you know more star warsy more i was just more into it Mm -hmm. um then i was more speculating about all the different storylines and stuff but it, it, it it's a lot of the same so far so um you know that's my overall thought is i hope it finds its stride uh mm-hmm. but you, uh i think they're probably we'll have to wait and see i don't know what the plan is with this show i hope they remain committed to it and there's plenty of time to develop stories in the timeline and for the show to hit its stride and and really get good and mm-hmm. um this is probably going to be like clone wars in that individual episodes or story arcs of like two or three episodes Mm -hmm. are going to stand out when you get it all done and over with and you stand back a little and look at it right so i'm looking forward to those Mm -hmm. uh kind of things and i I think we're also going to get some of the birth of the rebellion stuff or the development of the early rebellion and stuff oh i'm sure yeah so that stuff will be interesting maybe that's what they meant by saga white that's what i'm most intrigued by now is what you said yeah saga white implications exactly but uh but i'm just gonna have no expectations enjoy it um, I will call it out a little bit when I see them repeating themselves or leaning into a formula a little mm. bit, you know, but that's okay. I mean, it's, yeah. gonna, it's <laughs> at the end of the day, it's right. I'm going exactly. to watch each one and I'm going to, I'm going to like it. There's nothing to hate about it. So mm. um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're going to uh, switch gears here a little bit and talk. Uh, we, this past weekend um, we watched a few segments from different movies we watched uh, a couple in their entirety uh but a couple we just watched pieces of movies in uh of star wars in 4k now that disney plus has started um, uploading several of their films in 4k uh greedo has one of those so we were able to see it uh in all of its glory and, <laughs> and i must say oh. it is glorious <laughs> it was it's, good it's pretty incredible to watch a new hope and see a level of detail you know that just I've never seen before, you know, and that's the beauty of film. You can take film and upgrade it to however, you know, whatever high definition you can get it to because it's film. Unlike, you know, something that was recorded on videotape or, or or even digitally, depending on what your original settings are, you know, you just can't get it there. You can't add, you can take away, but you can't add to, you know, but film, it's all in there, you know, so that's, you know, that's, that's the beauty of it. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what, so, so what did you think of, of seeing this stuff in 4k? Did it change? Like, I know we talked about how the special effects looked a little different in certain aspects and, uh, things like that. Talk a little bit about, uh, about that kind of what, what effect it sort of had on the um, digital effects. And- yeah, there's a, there's a, I wouldn't call it an uncanny valley, but there's a, uh, a point where you begin to see behind the curtain a lot more because of the detail involved. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with stuff that was done. We watched a part of revenge of the Sith Mm -hmm. that was done in 2003, four, five. Yeah. Uh, It was released in 2005. Mm -hmm. So it's 16 years old now. And you watch media from the same time. There wasn't a lot of 
I mean, I don't remember for sure, but that was when high def TVs and stuff were maybe first starting to come along Mm -hmm. and you had maybe 720 sets or something. Um, So uh, the resolution has gone way up since those days. And what you can see, I mean, stuff wasn't designed to necessarily hold up uh, to that level of scrutiny. So anyway, um, some of the composition and different materials, you can definitely starting to see the age and the fact that, um, you know, they're just not holding up as well to that level of scrutiny. But overall, the colors are vibrant. The details are there. It's beautiful. Um, And it is what it is. It's an older movie now. We think that it is, you know, it feels like yesterday we saw it, but it is an older movie now. There's been a ton of movies since. Um, But it does hold up pretty well. Mm -hmm. But there are certain shots that are, you you know, you just, you're starting to think about it when you watch it now. Whereas before, I didn't think Mm -hmm. about it much. Um, well, you, well, you said something that got my attention, and it's very true. We talked about it that you made the comment that we're not that far away from video games that are going to have better, more, more realistic graphics. Yes, yeah, you know, than, yeah, than like a lot of that stuff. When you the see the Clone stuff. Wars, the, it's <laughs> going to be better on your PC or on your on your <laughs> next level uh, PlayStation or whatever, right? Your next generation PlayStation than it is in those movies. And yeah, that's exactly. Weird to think, but it probably is right around the corner. Probably true. Yeah, um, exactly. If they can make money off of it and justify that level, then mm-hmm. that's what we'll see right uh, but yeah i mean it, it just is the natural progression of things and that's why i don't like uh that's my main gripe about the star wars special editions i think they're worth it for the upgrade and the uh you know the resolution and the detail and the uh the soundtrack and the cleaning you know the, everything being cleaned up and they look amazing but the special effects they added in 1997 look like they were added in 1997 and right we we watched a new hope the entire thing and the Mm -hmm. only moments i didn't just totally love and fall in love with all over again were the special edition with the added moments yeah yeah because they they just they just clang now they Mm -hmm. do not fit you know i don't know if they ever did but now it's really obvious it's It's really obvious we go from practical effects and a certain feel and a certain Mm -hmm. group of artisans putting all this together in 1975 and six to you know people using uh you know photoshop and everything and yeah. whatever uh, effects programs in 1996 mm-hmm. and, and it's uh, and now it's changed again so uh it just doesn't hold up and it, it it really cheapens takes you out of the movie and cheapens those parts i agree i just, I just ignore it though you know because the movie is still there, i do too and soul, the movie yeah. still there. they didn't they Absolutely. didn't ruin everything you know right right um yeah for me for me that moment hits um when they arrive at um moss isley moss isley <laughs> right. yeah just the, the shot of the land speeder going yeah. into the distance that looks it's so completely computer generated with it going like this with 3p yeah, on the back i just like no and then they get into the ronto and all the stuff with the dogs even the people on. walking around the background don't look the same kind of like on cloud city and empire exactly yeah, yeah when they the added people that. That from night for the 90s don't look the same as the people from, from 1979 yeah exactly. yeah <laughs> it just doesn't it stands <laughs> out you know yeah and if we grew up with the special editions i'd have a completely different feeling about it i'm sure, sure. oh absolutely um, um but i think we entered an era of movie making where it's it became acceptable to put cheap gags in a movie all of a sudden to draw yeah. laughs. So when you have the you know the speeder buzz, the ronto or whatever that thing is, and the jaw was swinging from it, and you know it's ha 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 ha, it's mm-hmm. kind of like a belch take or something. And right. I, I mean, we had that by Return of the Jedi. We had creatures belching and farting and stuff, but it's just become you know so much worse over time. Yeah, um, it really has the crowd pleasing stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and and so. Um, I don't like seeing that in a new hope. A new hope is so perfect. It's just yeah. so. It just that was my other impression is we. I turned it on just to show you what it looked like and to show mm-hmm. them, you know to see it for myself too. Yeah. Uh, and we watched the whole memory. thing. <laughs> and we watched the whole thing because it's so freaking. We just compelling. can't turn it I mean, off. Yeah. yeah, it's just so freaking good. It really is. And, and not only did we watch the whole thing, we rewound several scenes. Oh yeah, <laughs> we watched yeah, that a we second just time. Enjoyed the hell out of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is the movie I've seen more than any other. Mm-hmm. The only one that would challenge it would be Raiders of the Lost Ark, but I know I've seen A New Hope. Yeah, for for me, Star it's probably Wars. a tie between Empire and uh, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, but yeah, but I've seen Star Wars. Yeah, it's right up there. <laughs> yeah, and I can still turn it on and watch it today and and just love it you know just mm-hmm. enjoy it it's, exactly it's really That's the perfect, lasting power you know? of these films yeah yeah, yeah and but absolutely. seeing that uh it's it's amazing that all of that you can see 
he can see all the kind of chinks in the armor now and the hairstyles are out of date everything but it's just perfect and people Absolutely. used to criticize star wars for the acting you know f off right. <laughs> the acting I know. in that film is perfect it's I don't perfect care. for it, what it is exactly. it, you know, it hits every note how could you do that movie without mark hamill without harrison Ford, without alec guinness without gary fisher without mm -hmm. uh you know tarkin without yeah. peter cushing anthony daniels um, and yeah, yeah exactly uh, dave Prouse, uh, peter right. Mayhew. It's just a perfect storm, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's phenomenal. Um, perfect storm. Is yeah, absolutely right. There's, I was trying to think of another movie I watched that has that same impact on every single level, you know. And it's hard. It's and, the, and you can still watch today. That is from mm -hmm. that era, or that uh, it's it's hard to. Uh, it's hard to think of one really but there yeah i mean there are a few that's I why mean, it's my number one but <laughs> right well for me i mean what you just described that's also i think alien yes in a lot uh, of ways yeah. the original alien film is that way it was just yeah, perfect, perfect casting in time yeah everything just hit perfect it's it's you know the pacing is perfect the, the 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 cinematography is perfect everything about that movie just works you know and that's and another movie that i can watch I over change. and over and over again and never get tired of <laughs> the only thing i would change is the editing on ash's head <laughs> no, oh yeah easy. yeah yeah but exactly I don't, but i don't think i would change it now i would no. go back in time and try to get them to get a little better then right but now right. i would not dare touch it it's perfect. No. you know I, it would be a sacrilege to change it and make it better oh, absolutely now. absolutely leave it alone because that was the best effort of the people at the time let their effort stand stand you know? yeah that would be mm -hmm. like like 97 with the special editions it would be such a blatant obvious computer oh yeah if thrown uh, into that would stick out like a sore thumb if ash was all cgi now you know like right. the character where they just decide to redo his whole character <laughs> yeah. cgi we're gonna <laughs> take ian home out and put in this. yeah it's <laughs> yeah. a cgi home yeah ian home yeah exactly and, and just read the whole thing yeah it's just no no that is no let's spirit. definitely not do that <laughs> yeah but uh, um, but my overall impression seeing 4k is just how beautiful they looked right and how they hold up the storytelling the editing mm -hmm. uh after seeing a lot of interviews with paul hirsch and, and everything the editing yeah. is amazing the music incredible how were these movies made <laughs> you know i have no yeah, idea just unbelievable <laughs> And they and I still enjoy watching the and they the 4K is a definite improvement. I just wish they would release the originals cleaned up in 4K. Right, the originals, not the special editions. Yeah. Um, what about you? Well, for me, uh, I mean, obviously, I kind of already echoed most of what you said. I, I love how it looked. I love the detail, um, just the color palette, the edge, everything about it is just so phenomenal. Um, if I had a critique, it would be for me. We've already talked about the digital effects, but even some of the practical effects, I thought with that level of scrutiny of 4K, some of the models started to look a little more modelish. If yeah. that makes sense, you know, yeah. it, it was almost, a, and it's not just from how they look, because they looked phenomenal, but it's some of the movement. It's almost yeah. like the, the way the 4K, it, 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 it almost starts to look more like stop motion than it did yeah. originally, you know, if, if that makes any sense. Well, because if, originally it was more blurred. There was That's the thing, yeah. We, it had we, that little bit of blurred. natural blur in there that, yeah. that made it look more natural. That's yeah. all exposed when you mm, create exactly. a higher frame rate, when you when you clean up everything and you just lay it out there in the sun. It's like, yeah. that's why exactly. so many special effects laden movies have so many big moments in the dark. So yeah, they can you know blend everything and, mm -hmm. and get away with cheaper a cheaper effort or sure. I won't say cheaper but cover yeah. some of the flaws less less you know? uh, less effort involved <laughs> and that was one thing admirable about, about the prequels is so much of it happens in broad daylight you know mm -hmm. they just go for it <laughs> and, you yeah. know whether it looks Absolutely. great or not they really mm -hmm. go for it and they tried really hard and um, those movies I think were pushing the technology of film just as much as they were pushing. The story of star wars and the world yeah. building and all that and yeah they definitely accomplished that you know no matter what else you have to say about them sure um so we watched um star wars in its entirety we watched uh a good chunk probably about the last half of uh revenge of the sith and then we also watched the last i don't know hour or so of another film uh, <laughs> and Greedo mentioned that he's got some new insight uh, on his feelings about this film and we're always concerned with Greedo's feelings here so <laughs> both of them both of my feelings I, I am going to turn truth. over the stage uh, and allow Greedo to rant about The Last Jedi <laughs> I don't think that's I don't think that's fair to make me the bad guy here because I, no, no, no. I will go on record as saying it is absolutely the worst thing ever so yeah hate okay. that film i hate everything about that film 
except for a couple of little moments that are okay. Yeah. <laughs> the dice just, just do me in every time. Yeah, the exactly. silly dice. The dice. But, yeah, but no, in 4K, it looked beautiful. That's mm-hmm. the, you know, it looked beautiful. Yeah, there's but, not, the sequel trilogy is a beautiful thing to watch. It's just not that fun to take in. <laughs> but I don't, I don't see how anyone, there's people that argue about how it is a good movie. It is a good movie. There's good qualities about it, but I could barely watch it because I noticed, you know, seeing it on the my huge TV and in 4K and everything, and having not seen it in a long time, it's just relentless with the silliness. It is really freaking And it relentless. starts from the opening scene. <laughs> yes, it does, which we didn't yeah. watch. But at the end, they're manufacturing tension, emotion, and all this by constantly zooming on everyone and everything in every yeah. moment. And it's an old, you know, Spielberg kind of, mm-hmm. you know, brought that into, it made that prominent. Every, right. every Spielberg movie zooms in at the big moments or whatever. And mm-hmm. it became kind of tiresome with him to me and a, and a trope where I got, when we go see his new movie, I'd be like, oh God, here we go with the zooming again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but still, it's just nonstop in the last mm-hmm. half of that movie. And it undermines, um, the, it does stop when Kylo Ren and Luke Skywalker have their confrontation. They do like half zooms. They just, they start with a close frame and move in a little bit and stop. Mm-hmm. But when, anytime Finn is on the screen or Rose or any of the minor characters. Oh, they're, yeah. They're, yeah, they're zooming all on just them. Right here, yeah. Yeah, like it's not good enough just to show them and let them have their own thing and let us figure out how we feel about it. Right. It has to constantly zoom in. It's like a cartoon. It's just so bad. And, right. Uh, Ryan Johnson, I think, is a good director from everything else I've seen by him. I don't understand the choice to constantly zoom on everything. Mm-hmm. It, it takes me right out of it. It's like saying the movie has those serious moments and is followed immediately by a joke. To take it now. Yeah. A serious moment, immediate joke. To take you it have now. to immediately yeah. relieve the tension. And the, yeah. that's what those that's what those camera movements are like. Mm-hmm. They they do not they try to manufacture something. But it's like adrenaline or something. It's not serious, and it it you you once you're aware of it, you can't stop seeing it. It mm-hmm. takes you right out of the movie, and it's just bad. I, if they cut that down a ton, I think I would like the movie a, a lot more. And I will mm-hmm. say, we in 4K, the Luke's final scene was absolutely gorgeous. It was yeah. beautiful. And, yeah, looked, and I have no objection no, no. to how that was done or anything. I just object to where it was done. Yeah, and the, I think yeah. it was a terrible timing to put it in that movie, but but uh, but it was a beautiful scene. So um, <clears throat> so anyway, that's that's the main thing I noticed is mm-hmm. the, I, I I I haven't watched it in so long that I always took away the things I disliked about it thematically, the dialogue, the jokes, the ham-handed jokes, the humor. I forgot that the aesthetic of the visual of the movie matches that. You know that mm-hmm. it's relentless. It's not just a joke said by a character after a serious moment the camera won't let you off the hook you know the camera is forcing you to not take it seriously the whole time exactly it's just yeah i feel bad i just feel bad for the actors and everything i really do i agreed (laughs) this is painful um yeah i don't really have anything to add to that it's just it's a beautiful movie it's beautiful it doesn't look like star wars but it looks like a beautiful movie (sighs) yeah um fortunately we started watching it post canto bite um <laughs> so i didn't I have to I lose my lunch again. i don't mean i didn't have to actually lose that's my what lunch. i kept saying even though canto bite was named i kept saying this is like harry potter this is harry potter this is mm-hmm. star wars this is harry potter yeah it felt a lot like that with the mm-hmm. constant zooming that's that's kind of what they did with a lot of the harry potter stuff yeah is, yeah agreed and it's kind of like saying this is a really important moment but you can't just keep doing that and not deliver you know, mm-hmm. you should do it when the moment is actually really important, not yeah. every five seconds, you know. I'm going to take a stopwatch. I'm going to time the, the, that between Zooms <laughs> in the last part of that yeah. movie. Just like another Zoom. Exactly. Another zoom. Oh, that's so funny. Um, yeah, so from the opposite end of the enjoyment spectrum, uh, we also watched uh, Row <laughs> Row One in its entirety. Um, oh, that was fantastic. And it was phenomenal. Yeah, that movie is just so great. Um not not really any new insights from that i guess just uh just the fact that it was insight. so and so enjoyable what was your new insight <laughs> no zooming <laughs> there's literally no, almost no zooming in that it isn't slow it's not cartoonish but no the movie 
has epic visual moments mm -hmm. that yeah. make it feel huge and and that is a big difference mm -hmm. uh, the last jedi did that with the hyperspace ramming and some of the moments um but it constantly counteracts itself rogue one doesn't do that yeah. when it has a big visual moment it doesn't bring it down by by cheapening it or making it a joke or saying you know, oh nudge nudge wink wink don't take it right seriously. it's like it's it's almost like if the if the uh, that scene happened in the last jedi with the uh, star destroyers crash they would have gone inside the star destroyer to do yeah. uh, a quick joke like a poem <laughs> right. about something you know it's like right. well we can't be too serious for two, for more than 12 seconds you know no, the captain of the of the of the hammerhead cover would be like i hope they were insured <laughs> exactly exactly that would yeah. be that would be a last uh, I, hope I, we got, I hope our insurance is paid off because we just caused a major accident <laughs> i don't know but but no it's that's that right movie's designed to have epic visual moments like every time the death star appears is epic it's mm -hmm. beautiful. It's Every so time amazing. Some shot. big action yep. piece happens. It looks incredible. It it is. It takes none of that for granted. None of it's thrown away, mm -hmm. and and it makes it feel insane. You know, I mean, it, the difference. <laughs> I don't even know. And Rogue One was pieced together after the fact, mm -hmm. supposedly. That's but the it thing. Yeah. Feels so much. They basically more reshot half visually. the film. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about story wise, but visually, it feels incredibly well. They, they, I mean, they stuck so many great moments and it's worth yeah, watching absolutely. just for that. Incredible. Yeah. So, so good. And it feels like Star Wars. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we had a, we had a very um, busy weekend just watching lots of Star Wars, as you can see. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's anything else we watched. I know we watched Bad Batch and we watched the movies we just we mentioned. Watched Alien. We watched Alien because that was on another <laughs> channel. <laughs> we were switching back and, and We were switching back and forth between Rogue, Rogue One and Alien. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was a very, very enjoyable weekend, that's for sure. Yes, yeah, um, like they programmed that weekend just for us. Yeah, they really did. <laughs> if Blade Runner had been on <laughs> yeah. another channel. <laughs> or Raiders or something. Yeah, Raiders. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's so funny. Um, but yeah, so that's basically uh, uh, kind of our t uh, original take here on uh, on 4K, uh, that we really, really like it. You know, it, it definitely makes the films even more beautiful, if that's possible. Um, so I was I was really happy to have a chance to kind of kind of watch those and, uh, and, and see those for myself. Um, but yeah, um, so we're going to wrap up uh, this episode with an O with a Veracu because I basically forgot to do it at the beginning. Um, <laughs> but I got something uh, that just arrived yesterday. It's still cool. And I'm, I'm, it's definitely still cool. And uh, I'm, I'm, I kind of have a feeling I'm going to start a collection of uh, these types of things because I'm really kind of getting into this. But here it is. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I love Captain that style. Cardinal's helmet. Yeah. Yep. It's supposed to be a good uh, book. I haven't, I haven't read it. Yeah. Uh, what was it? What was her name? Phasma. Yeah. Phasma book. Right. Exactly. All right. Let me get this thing out of here. She was supposed to be a much better character in the book then. Oh, wow. Said. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. That's slick. Yeah. That's really nice. Veracu. Mm -hmm. Definitely Where'd qualifies you, uh, as Veracu. Where did you uh, get that from? GameStop? Uh, just, just on Amazon. Oh, okay. Found on Amazon. Show us the uh, inside. What is the inside? For yeah. Whatever. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So I haven't really looked at it that much. It just got here yesterday afternoon, and I've only barely taken it out of the box. But uh, Nice. Glass is going to fit in there. Right. <laughs> there you go. I like. <laughs> Captain Traffic Cone. <laughs> What's that? What's that? I said, I said, no, I said it looks beautiful. <laughs> uh, yeah. I didn't say anything. <laughs> that looks great. So, it does look well, great. Anyway. So there's the Veracu for this week. And uh, on that note, uh, leave us a like, leave us a comment, uh, subscribe to the channel, and we will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. I got another one coming, by the way. Oh, I'll no. oh, okay. have that one in the next uh, second. This will be here Thursday. That looks great. I thought, yeah. Stick around long enough
You'll be lucky just to lose a hand. You'll be one hair. Singing yum yum. Yum yum. Raise your glass and sing yum yum. Yum yum. Yum yum. At the Cantina Club. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great song. <laughs> Ask the boy Gullit. <laughs> Ask the boy Gullit. Lies, deceptions. <laughs> yeah, and those sound effects in the back. Every day more lies. Yeah. <laughs> Every day more lies. <laughs> Every day more lies. <laughs> nice. yeah, it's like a 40s show tune. <laughs> exactly. Lies. That's what's so great about it. Annoying lies. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome.